All right. Välkomna. Welcome. Eller, jag tar, måste jag. Uh, välkomna till Folkets Radio. Welcome to yet another precious interview with John Lamb Lash, a comparative mythologist, Gnostic scholar, and shaman. John, it's great to have you with us again. Good to be here. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen our previous interviews, I would really recommend that you do that, since you will benefit much more from this one. Uh, in our first talk, we, we discussed, among other things, the ancient mysteries and the mystery schools, the network of mystery schools that were spread all over the Mediterranean basin and northern Africa and parts of the Middle East, and how they were completely obliterated by the Roman church and forbidden. And uh, we also talked about the sacred rite of initiation, which you, John, call the encounter with the organic light. Uh, and today we're going to expand on this topic and how you developed or perhaps rediscovered a method of having this encounter. And we agreed that a very good place to start would be in the 1960s in the psychedelic revolution. So, John, why is that such a good place to start? Well, uh, there was an element in the psychedelic revolution of the 60s which I would characterize as a genuine uh, quest, a genuine uh, interest mm -hmm. in having mystical experiences that were of a religious type. So not all of the tripping was recreational, you see. Certainly my tripping in the 60s with LSD was not recreational. And even though I didn't have the guidelines that I have today for using entheogens correctly, something guided me on a certain path. And I would say that there was a genuine and deep interest in the mystical dimension of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some of my peers in that time were taking LSD with that intention. Of course, many others were just taking it for the thrill. Hmm. Right. Just to begin with the basics, what is a psychedelic experience in the psychedelic? <clears throat> well, it actually, the word actually means uh, something that pleases the psyche. Hmm. Something that delights the psyche. And that uh, definition which is the etymology of the word, mm. goes in the direction of ecstasy. So you see, in the early 50s, there was a, a famous historian of religions named Merce Eliade. He was Romanian. Mm. And back then in the 50s and in the 60s, there were very few books about shamanism. Today there are too many. Mm. And he wrote a break through book in shamanism called Shamanism, Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. And that word in that title is tremendously significant because it points to an often overlooked fact, which is that in trance states and under the influence of certain entheogens, certain psychoactive plants, mm -hmm. uh, the subject experiences ecstasy. And this ecstasy is an extremely powerful emotion that completely takes over your being. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see it in some of the documentary films of the 60s of, of the hippies on LSD, you know, dancing in the park in San Francisco and so forth. Yeah, they were in ecstasy. Hmm. But what kind of ecstasy was it and how did they handle it? And what did they experience when they were in that ecstasy? What did they realize? So the essence of the psychedelic experience to me contains two components. First, if you surrender to it, it will take you into a state of bliss or ecstasy. 
which is comparable to religious ecstasy. And many people have compared the psychedelic experience to a state of religious revelation. Many, many, it's an old cliche. Mm -hmm. But the second factor, and this is the tricky factor, it took me many years to learn this, learn about this other factor, which is the cognitive factor. What can you actually know? What can you actually learn? What can you actually realize in that state? So in the 1960s, I was 15 years old in 1960, and I was thrust into the movement of my generation. But I must add a few caveats. I did not really fit into my generation. Even though I was in there, I was not of that generation in the way that they behaved. So uh, I did not get along with hippies. I did not like hippies. Uh, the same thing for my close companion at that time, Jan Kerouac, who was the daughter of the famous American writer, Jack Kerouac. Mm -hmm. Dan and I kept to ourselves. We were really private people. We didn't like hippies. Mm -hmm. I never did LSD with anyone else during the eight or 10 times I took it, around 66, 67. Always took it by myself. And I never participated in orgies with hippies. I never went out dancing with them. Mm -hmm. But I was at the heart of that generation. And what happened to me was that somehow uh, I was able to make a path through that movement. I didn't belong to the movement. I didn't identify with it, but I certainly felt the zeitgeist. I certainly felt the revolutionary need to liberate consciousness from programming, from indoctrination, from parental scripts from religion and many, many people felt this need. That is what gave us a unity. But something about me, I don't know, maybe it's inexplicable, led me to find my way through that and to take a path that eventually led me to the mysteries. Hmm. And that's not, I don't wanna to go too deep into this, but there's a lot of speculation of what actually brought about the psychedelic movement. Some people claim that CIA played a major role by buying up tons of LSD and handing out to college students that there were basically two movements, one underground authentic counterculture movement, and then one more sort of devious that was sort of really about social engineering, but that they basically lost control of their own PSYOP finally, so they stopped it. I don't know how you view that. That's correct. That's more or less how I view it. Yeah. There was an authentic grassroots counterculture movement. Yeah. And I am a living survivor of that. Mm -hmm. I have never lost the beat. No. I have never dropped a stitch mm -hmm. from the movement. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that, according to the way the authorities work, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, they saw in the youth movement a, a wave, a tremendous tsunami happening of revolt, rebellion. And uh, they also saw, or thought they saw, it's better to say, they thought they saw possibility of enforcing their authoritarian mind control games through the use of LSD. They thought that LSD could be used as a tool for mind control. Mm -hmm. And so they hijacked a good part of the movement. Mm -hmm. And that, that hijacking was a terrible tragedy of my generation. Mm -hmm. My opinion of I'm extremely fortunate in that I escaped that hijacking. Mm -hmm. It didn't affect me. One reason why it didn't affect me was because I dropped out of college, you see. It's really important when you look back at that picture to bear in mind that there were in college at that time uh, certain influential professors, yeah. namely Herbert Marcusa and others. And these men who came out of the Frankfurt School and that whole mafioso legacy, 
mm. uh, had a very definite agenda of wanting to seize the genuine impulses of my generation and steer them in a leftist Marxist direction. Mm. Which they did. I never had any part of that whatsoever. I was completely saved from all that. Mm. Uh, but it's important to see those were the factors in the equation. And uh, <clears throat> if you ever read the book, it's by a man named John Marx, I think, M-A-R-K-S, about uh, the making of the Manchurian candidate. Mm -hmm. You'll see that it gives a very good coverage of how the CIA experimented with LSD on people. Not only did they do individual ex experiments giving LSD to, to subjects and not telling them and then filming them, mm -hmm. but they also took over when LSD was made illegal in 1966. They played a large part in the under, uh, underground market of LSD. So they, they thought that they could manage uh -huh. LSD as a tool to their purposes, and uh, they couldn't. Oh. They couldn't, they say. Yeah, talking about the university, uh, one other very famous, I don't know if he was a professor, a scholar, Timothy Leary, he created this meme, turn on, tune in and drop out. I think Richard Nixon called him the most dangerous man in America. And this meme really had a lot of impact, didn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, I dropped out. <laughs> I dropped out of college, but I didn't do it because Timothy Leary told me to do so. Okay. You know? I encountered that slogan. It was everywhere. You couldn't really uh, avoid it, you know. Uh, but at the height of the 60s, um, when Timothy Leary was uh, a guru, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really have much to do with that. I I dropped out of college, not because I was rebelling against society, but just because I thought it was stupid and uh, it wasn't, uh, it, I wasn't interested in what they were teaching in college. I was really disappointed. Uh, so yeah, uh, a lot of my generation were influenced by that formula. And I also, I lived, I used to live in Laurel Canyon, not far from where Leary lived in the 70s late 70s and I talked to him on the phone once and uh, almost met him I never ended up actually meeting him but years later I did meet his close confidant and uh, partner Joanna Harcourt Smith mm -hmm. so she was I think she was married to Leary I'm not sure anyway she was incredibly close to Leary and through her I learned a lot about Timothy Leary and uh, it's uh, it's an important story, and I'm not sure if the complete truth of that story has ever been told. Hmm. Yeah, that's something we maybe we can develop another time. Maybe you could explain a bit more how these experiences of the 1960s set you on your path of becoming a shaman and eventually to study the Gnostic teachings. Well. I didn't take LSD over a long period of time. I took it within like a three year period. The first time I ever took it, actually, I was in Madras, India, mm. because I spent about two and a half years uh, after I dropped out of college mm. in the year Kennedy was assassinated, mm. I left the country. And I spent about two and a half years traveling around the world. I spent time in Japan and uh, Laos, Cambodia, you know, uh, and in India and Nepal. And uh, so the first time I took LSD, I was actually not in the United States in the setting of my generation. I was very far away in India. Then when I got back, I was living in the Lower East Side of the New York, New York City. That's where I met Jan Kerouac. And uh, I wanted to experience more with it because my first experience in Madras, India had been really monumentally strange and disorienting. And I felt that I wanted to have that change of consciousness, you know, altered state. This is the term. I wanted to go into an altered state, which is what shamans do. But I wanted to be able to handle myself there, you know. Mm. So I took LSD intentionally 
in New York City, fortunately, I had the opportunity to have some of the best LSD, uh, Sandos, when it was still really pure, it was not adulterated. And uh, what happened to me was I, I was really completely on my own path. Uh, I had found Zen in Japan when I was traveling in the Far East. And I was very attracted to Chan, which is the Chinese form of Zen, Chan and Zen. And I was extremely attracted to this idea of non-attainment Buddhism. Now, very few people know what that is. In fact, I don't know if I've ever met a Buddhist who knows what non-attainment Buddhism is. But it's the, it's the Zen spin. It's Satori, sudden enlightenment. It's just like enlightenment is something that just happens to you instantly. And you don't have to go through elaborate practices to achieve it. I was really attracted to this idea. And I think what happened to me in those early days when I was taking LSD in New York City was that I took LSD sort of with the idea that I was just going to have an, a sudden enlightenment, you see. Uh, and so I was, I did it in a very uh, solitary way. And I also did it uh, in a limited way. In other words, I wasn't looking for kicks. I wasn't going out and going to hippie events. I just stayed by myself and I just wanted to, to reach. I couldn't really define what I wanted to understand, but what I was looking for was to reach some pure awareness of what consciousness is and to have some pure, clear experience of what consciousness is. And I did have those experiences, fortunately. Uh, there are two things that guided me during my early LSD experiences. Like I say, I took them for, for a period of about three years. I experimented with LSD, and then for a long time, I did. For instance, Jen and I were together at, at that time. And we left New York and we went to Mexico and we went to the country and we never did LSD together. We never did any, anything, mushrooms or anything. But during those three years, I'd say there were two things that uh, determined my particular way of undergoing the psychedelic experience. One of them was that I resisted hallucinating. Now, if you ask me why I did that or how I even had the idea that I wasn't going to hallucinate, I can't exactly tell you. It's just something that I knew. I remember it so clearly uh, because when people around me in that genre, hippies talked about LSD, they always talked about all the hallucinations they saw. And I, I didn't want to see any hallucinations. I just wanted to see what was consciousness. And the second thing was the light, of course. The first time that I bought LSD in New York City, which was probably in 1967, uh, I paid $5 for it. And I went to the house of the person, completely someone that I didn't know, I walked in met him, we shook hands, we looked at each other. It was kind of a solemn moment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, okay, I respect you, you respect me, I know why you're here. And I gave him the money, and he had this tab of sandals, and he put it in my hand, and he said, may you see the clear light. Mm -hmm. Now, that will give you some idea of how some people at that time were serious and sincere mystics wow. who used LSD in the correct way. Mm -hmm. And so this thing about the clear light is really interesting. Uh, Alpert Leary and Metzner talk about seeing the clear light in their book, The Psychedelic Experience, which is an excellent book, by the way. Mm -hmm. Even today, if anyone wants to take LSD, read it. It talks about ego death. 
which is the essential uh, the essential requirement for a true experience. And uh, I thought, well, what about this thing about light? You know, light. Well, anyone who's taken LSD, good LSD, knows that there are two primary phenomena that happen to you when it comes on. One is you hear a ringing sound, a really high, steady, sweet, very, very sweet ringing sound. And there's something about this ringing sound that's ecstatic. It's, it's beautiful to hear it and it kind of carries you into the trip. And the other thing is, of course, the light. The light that you see, I mean, everything is so brilliantly illuminated by the light and you can see the microscopic details of everything, You're looking at your own hands. You can see the cells in your own hands and everything is magnified in this tremendous light. So I had that experience of light. I found it really uh, to be genuine. It's not something that just it's not an hallucination, <laughs> no. It's a heightened perception of what really is. But that experience of the clear light of LSD was only kind of a clue because later on, much later in my path of shamanism, I came to realize that there was another kind of light, which I call the organic light. Mm -hmm. And that is not a clear light. The clear light is a light that you see through, or it's like the light of a powerful flashlight, mm -hmm. a beam from a powerful, it's clear, and I shine it on something. But the organic light is not like that. So when did you decide that you were gonna become a shaman? Oh, I don't know. You know, <coughs> excuse me. I don't, I don't call myself a shaman, I suppose I am. Some people would say I'm an expert chum, but I just, I like to use the term uh, experimental mysticism. Mm -hmm. So I'm a mystic, someone, who, <clears throat> excuse me, who explores the mysteries of the world, mm -hmm. of the natural and supernatural worlds. And sometimes I do that using the aid of psychoactive plants, or of LSD, and sometimes I do it without, you see. So what put me on the path, it was so many things. It was a long, long path. Uh, like I was just saying, <clears throat> I didn't, after that period in New York, then Jan and I were together, and we lived together in the country. We never did anything at all. We never did drugs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And Jan herself, at the time I met her, she was 14, I think, 14 or 15. And she had already taken LSD 12 times. First time she took it was when she was 12 years old. Wow. And Jan, Jan told me a lot. She talked a lot about what she experienced on LSD when I first met her. She talked about how she saw the molecular structure of matter, like you could see DNA, you could see molecules and things. She talked about how she used to uh, have the impression that she was transported into ancient Egypt. There was something very Egyptian about Jan. Uh, and she talked about Anubis, the jackal god of the, of the necropolis and how she would walk through the streets of the Lower, Lower East Side and she would see hieroglyphs everywhere, you know. She was hallucinating, of course, but the way that she described it was amazing. So uh, she did, but when we got together, she said, I can't take it anymore. I've had too much and I just, I don't want to do it again. You know, I, obviously, I mean, come on. She had a boyfriend at the time. He was about 10 years older than her giving a 12 year old girl LSD, excuse me, you know? So she knew what it was and she knew that I had a serious interest in it, but we never did it together. So 
my life went on for a long time and I didn't even think about taking LSD or mushrooms. Uh, but gradually I became involved with the subject of shamanism. Uh, and I think it's because I think what attracted me to it was the fact that in my generation, the 60s, there was not much literature about it. And even then in the 70s, it started like with Terence McKenna mm. in the 70s and the 80s. And then suddenly there was this explosion of interest in shamanism. And so that was one factor, at least, that brought me back to that path and that caused me to say, okay, I think, uh, I think I'm going to start experimenting again, but this time I'm going to use mushrooms. Okay. So um, the Gnostics, they call themselves telestai, which means we who are aimed. And I think for people who have listened to your talks, they might have noticed that you use the word direction and aim in a slightly different manner than the mainstream use. Is this important to understand shamanism or psychedelic experiences, this, this direction? It is primary and essential. I, I don't know how, if I have a particular spin in using it, uh, that isn't like the mainstream, uh, but uh, no, this is direction, self-direction, are, are, are primary concepts in what I teach in my whole worldview. Mm. And that is what is called, and if you want to use the technical language, it's called teleology, which again comes from the same root as teleste, mm. telos, or telos meaning goal, aim, purpose. So I hold to the fundamental view that the human animal is a teleological animal. It's an animal that lives by being goal directed directed by goals you see and the way that the, the direction of a goal the direction of any person that any person takes in their life depends on the narrative of their life so these are fundamental concepts of what i teach i teach that there must be a guiding narrative and that narrative directs you along a certain path in life. And if you don't have a guiding narrative that you know by heart and love and trust, your life is going to be like without a compass and you will find you will not find your purpose. And is this also present within the shamanic experience when you have the, this experience? Well, it is if you intentionally make it present. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, this is not the case. I am pretty sure now, because I've been talking about this for how long? <clears throat> I don't know, 20 years, maybe 15, who knows what time is. But uh, I am pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, that I'm the only individual talking about shamanism, entheogens, LSD mushrooms, who proposes the method of the telestic trance, which is a directed trance. I mean, people experiment with DMT. You can read, you know, hundreds of blogs. You can watch thousands of videos of people talking about their ayahuasca and their mm -hmm. DMT experiences. But that's not what I do. I do it in an intentional and directed way. That's what telestic means. It means directed, aimed for a purpose and others don't seem to be doing it that way i suppose they just think well oh dmt okay well take some dmt yeah and i have a purpose i want to see how it affects me i want to learn something about consciousness or something vague like that but no my the method that i have discovered and teach is very rigorous and very precise. You go into the trance with a question. And that question is your purpose for altering your consciousness. And then when you're in the trance, 
this is the discipline because not everyone can do this. You have to remember the question. Mm. And then if you have been able to bring yourself to the organic light, you actually ask the question to the organic light. And that is the purpose of the experiment. And that is secret method of the mysteries. That is exactly what they did in the mysteries. And they called it instruction by the light. Hmm. That's an exact term. You can find that in not his image. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm looking very much forward to ask you more in detail about your protocols. I just wanted to, for those people who maybe haven't heard the, the first interview, we talked about the Nag Hammadi codices and library of, of books that were miraculously found in an Egyptian cave uh, after like 2000, they were like 2000 years old. And, and thanks to those books, we have some knowledge what actually the Gnostics were teaching beyond all the distortions and, and censorship. So I read somewhere that you, you, you said that you have, you have read these texts like 20 times I'm just wondering, did you, when you were born the same week that these texts were found, did you have like a feeling early on that you had some certain connection that this was going to be like your destiny in life? That... Well, that is a fact as far as I know, and it's a curious one. Hmm. So they are said to have been discovered in the first week of December 1945. So I was born in the first week of December 1945, right? So what do you make of that? Well, I would say this, uh, I was really intrigued by the word Gnostic when I first encountered it. And uh, yeah, and that was in my teens, probably when I was reading you. Mm -hmm. But like Gnostic, it's like, it didn't mean anything to me. You know, it was sort of like a, a cloud in my mind. And every time I would look at it, I would say, oh, Gnostic, you know, what's that, you know? And it would kind of change shape. And so I had a certain, uh, I wouldn't say that the fact that I was born in that week created some magical connection. No. As a matter of fact, uh, when I first began to read the Nag Hammadi, when they came out in 76, 77, right? Mm. So I, I would have been like, uh, what, 45? 30, 35 years old, whatever. I couldn't make any sense of them at all. <clears throat> and I, one of the reasons why I went back and read them over and over again was because I couldn't make any sense out of them. They were so muddled and contradictory and fragmentary and, uh, you know, and yet I kept going back and going back. There was something that took me back to them over and over again. So first I just read only the Nag Hammadi Library in English, which is the standard English edition. And I have to warn you, if you can read that and make any sense out of it, then you, you are truly a genius mm -hmm. because it's just garbage. It's gibberish, you know? But, so then I went on to other things and I started to like find more books about the Gnostics and the mysteries. I was always fascinated by the mysteries since I read The Birth of Tragedy by Nietzsche when I was 16, where he talks about the Apollonian and Dionysian mysteries. And I remember like, what? What is, what is he talking about? Because he really doesn't explain what they were because he wasn't a scholar of religion. And it was very, I, I have to emphasize to people listening, you know, I'm really old, I'm really down the road, but for the good part, of my earlier life, it was hard to find anything about these matters. You know, it, it was really difficult. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of books available. So gradually, somehow, that curiosity about Gnosticism grew. I read the Nag Hammadi. Uh, I got fascinated by the figure of Mary Magdalene. I had kind of a Mary Magdalene fixation, and that kind of leads into Gnosticism, and uh, there was a trigger moment at some point. I think it was around 1997. That's when I started to write a book called Lord of the Clones, which turned out to be not in his image. Hmm. 
And there was a trigger moment when suddenly it was like, I don't know, <clears throat> it was like a shock went through my system. And I said to myself, you know, okay, finally, I'm going to go to the Narcomani and I'm going to crack it. I'm finally going to crack it. And I don't know what gave me that determination. It just came up out of my innermost being. Mm. But that's exactly what I did. So what was it? Pulling you back, reading it over and over again. It was something you sensed in it, right? Yeah, I sensed that there was something in there that you couldn't find anywhere else, which is definitely true. Mm. I certainly was attracted to it because of the primacy of the goddess figure because I have always been a goddess boy and all my life I have been in love with the mythological image of the goddess you know mm -hmm. so books like the white goddess by Robert Graves were like like the what the bible is to other people that was that to me mm -hmm. and also it's good that you bring this up because I realize as we're speaking that another factor that led me to the wisdom goddess herself, the divine Sophia, was that I was researching many books about goddess religion. And there was a movement in the, I think it was in the late 70s and into the 80s, to some degree involving feminist scholars, you know, but it was a genuine movement and it was called uh, Goddess Reclamation. Mm -hmm. So there were books and scholars and people who were, try who were trying to say, let's go back to the ancient roots of Egypt, Sumeria, Greece, wherever, and let's dig out the body of the goddess because she's been buried under a lot of trash mm -hmm. and let's restore the image of the goddess. And I was tremendously attracted to that. And that was another vector that led me down the course to that final moment where it all it all came together in night. I think it was in the spring of 1997. Mm. So for those who, who perhaps haven't heard the previous interviews, if you can just have a short recollection. What is the encounter with the organic light? Well, it's a unique experience. And I consider it to be the most beautiful experience of which a human animal is capable. I say that because the organic light is a phenomenon of nature. It's not an hallucination. It's not something that happens in your mind. It's a phenomenon of nature, just like waterfalls, giraffes, rivers, mm. the dirt under your feet but it is the presence of super nature, of a supernatural living luminosity that is alive, okay? <clears throat> and the experience of this light happens in a trance state. You are in ecstasy when you see it. You, you are in ecstasy even before you see it. Ecstasy brings you to it. And then when you see it, there is even a higher ecstasy, but I have to emphasize something. I don't know, you know, one of my problems that I have in communicating and teaching <clears throat> is that I'm really a solitary figure and I, I'm not social and I never have been. I mean, I've had a good social life here and there, but basically I, I live in a retreat and one of the unfortunate consequences of that is that I don't know how people talk socially. I don't, I don't follow social clues. I don't know what the tropes are, what the memes are. I'm a little better at it now, but for most of my life, I didn't have a clue what people were talking about because, you know, when, you, when people talk socially, words are not just words, you know? Uh, uh, let's say a car is not just a car. The word car has connotations hmm. to it. And I could never follow what these connotations were. 
So I'm bringing this up now because I'm wondering what are the connotations for normal people uh, to the word ecstasy? What, what, do you, what do you visualize when I use that word? You're asking me? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking you, why not? You're the only yeah. one here right now. Well, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a feeling of very strong bliss and pleasure and, and um, sort of harmony. But how does someone in a state of ecstasy behave? How do you picture their behavior? Are they shouting and dancing and waving their arms? Probably could be, yeah. It probably could be okay. part of a, of, a, of a sexual experience, I guess. They also could be in lotus posture with their eyes closed and in meditation, right? Well, I guess, yeah. Yeah, you, some people claim that yogic practices lead you to bliss, right? Mm. So the point I'm making is that when you're in this state of ecstasy, you don't, uh, one of the rules of the mysteries is that you don't exclaim. That's why it's called the mysteries. The mysteries are the places, are the rituals. When you experience ecstasy and surrender in the presence of the supernatural, but you don't exclaim, you don't shout out. The word mystery comes from a Greek word, muay, which means quiet. You can murmur, but you cannot shout. And so, so when you're in the presence of the organic light, which is the most beautiful experience anyone can have, it's the most beautiful sight, uh, you don't wave your arms and shout and jump around. You're very calm, very sober. And say that's part of the discipline. And you can't, you can't hold that experience unless you are calm and sober. You know what so the main point is of this practice, Celestic Shamanism, is that you use the uh, psychoactive plant as an emissary. The plant is the one who takes you to the presence of the organic light. You say, well, why can't you get there yourself without it, right? I often get this question asked. Well, you can. And in some cases, I have gotten to the organic light. You know, it came to me spontaneously mm -hmm. and to others as well. But if you want to go there deliberately with a question to be instructed by the wisdom goddess herself with your divine mother, then you use these protocols. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the plant emissaries is twofold. One, they allow you to put your ego aside. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do they do that? It's brilliant the way they do it. When you accept like a psilocybe mushroom, like Cubensis or Mexicana, and you drink a potion or you eat the mushrooms, you are actually letting that species borrow your nervous system and they will run your nervous system in a way that you can't run it. Mm -hmm. And they will take it to a heightened level because that's what they do. That's why they exist. They're benevolent allies and teachers. And in taking you to a heightened consciousness, they allow you to have the privilege of your ego melting away. Now, you don't entirely forget who you are. You don't get amnesia. You don't freak out because you can't remember your name. It just doesn't matter who you are anymore. You're just a naked, anonymous witness to the most sublime sight in all of nature, which is this light. And this light what I'm telling you now, by the way, was it never was allowed to be told. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that also. This, the mysteries, the ancient mysteries were protected by a vow of silence, not to speak right. publicly. Was this something you, you thought about <clears throat> before going public with the mysteries that the time had come to sort of break this vow? Yeah, I thought about it a lot. <coughs> 
excuse me, you can't imagine how much I thought about it. And I still do. Because that was a, it was a big thing, at least for me it was, you know. And I know why. It was a big thing because I know why they did not talk outside their mystery cells about what I'm telling you now. They didn't because I have explained it and not in his image. It's like if I knew a beautiful place by a waterfall and a pool and some beautiful rocks and a garden and, and magical animals around, you know, and I used to go there all the time and it was just a place of such beauty and bliss. And you're my friend and I want to take you there. Well, it's better if I kind of just take you there blindfolded. Because if I describe it all to you before I take you there, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, have the expectations. Yeah, you have expectations. And also, because you who knows what you will think, who knows what the people that are listening now think about what I'm saying. Uh, I can describe the properties of the organic light in great detail. Mm. And I can assure you that they are the same for everyone who has them, who has that experience. But the Manishas decided, well, we take great care in choosing people into our inner circle, and we take great care in following our protocols. So we trust that our method will allow people to reach the organic light, but we're not going to tell them what it's like to be there beforehand. Hmm. We're just going to leave them to have the pure spontaneity of the experience, you see? But I broke that vow, and I, I've described it extensively. And yeah, I do, uh, I think about that now and then. Believe me, I do. Just on this point that a lot of people are opposed to the use of any substances, saying that one don't need drugs, quote unquote, to have a mystical experience. I want to read a short quote from your book, not in his image. Initiates in the mysteries realize that the goddess requires of those to whom she reveals, reveals herself the humility to admit that they cannot fully know what it means to be human without the inspired guidance of non-human beings, including plants. So. Yeah. You know, I would say to those people, first of all, I've had it both ways. I've had extremely intense, brilliant, life-changing, mystical experiences. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, with and without uh, sacred plants. Use the proper terms, my friends, okay? You never accuse me of taking drugs. I don't take drugs. I think I, I, think I uh, had cocaine like like four times in my life in some weird situation, you know somebody offered me some mm. GMT that no 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 these are sacred plants they are given to us by nature and I would say to those who categorically insist that we don't use any kind of substance to achieve higher consciousness I would say you're saying that due to not realizing how insane you are how insane you are because the goddess has given us these special nitrogenous plants which have what are called psychomimetic properties the chemicals in these plants are just like the chemicals in your brain you know that mm -hmm. the same chemicals why did she create this special species of these plants that change our consciousness because she knows that we have a tendency to go insane. And this is a cure to our insanity. And even more important, I would stress mm -hmm. to those who are listening, uh, consider what ego death is. And I will not take criticism or advice from anyone about my shamanic discipline who has not themselves experienced the reality of ego death because that's what the plants do they bring you through the portal of ego death into the greater sacred connection with life that's why they're here they are gifts from the goddess 
So you spent many years in Andalusia in Spain. And if, if I understand correctly, that's where you developed some of these protocols uh, for encountering the organic light. Uh, so perhaps that's a good place where you can just tell us a bit about these protocols and how you, how what you did there in, in Andalusia. <coughs> well, I spent 14 years practicing shamanism in the mountains of Serenia de Ronda, mm. Andalusia, Spain. And uh, yeah, during that time, uh, momentous, I had momentous experiences. And uh, I formulated much of what I teach based on those experiences. Now, other people did come and go, but, uh, and some of them I also served as a guide to shamanic experiences, but most of them were able to handle the discipline. And so I wasn't completely alone, but the protocols came about as I faced one simple question or two questions. Okay, if these plant allies will act as emissaries and go between and take me to the organic light, well, that's wonderful because it means that I have the option that I can go by choice. Oh, oh today I think I'll go to the organic light, right? You know, that's a very big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, that's nothing small. I said, okay, but I have the option. But then on the other hand, uh, how can I be sure that I'm making the correct use of that experience? Not just going there for the thrill of it. Uh, I'm not just going there, you know, to be in reverent awe before the naked body of Sophia, because that's what it is. It's her naked body. It's plasma, actually, if you want to put the current term on it. The body of the Aeon Sophia is a mass of living, luminous, intelligent plasma. She doesn't appear in, a, in any particular form. It's just this mass of light. And it's very mysterious, you see? So I had experienced it. And uh, I had an experience, actually, it was in the southern France in May of the year 2000. And that's the moment I describe in my writings when I stabilized my perception of the organic light. So what I mean by that is in previous telestic experiences with mushrooms, I was able to, to encounter the light. I knew that it was there. By the way, it's soft and elusive. It's mysterious. Hmm. It's very seductive and mysterious doesn't like overcome you with like brilliance or anything like that. So I had kind of been flirting with it, you might say. Mm. And then I had this experience in this little shepherd's cottage in the south of France when I, I had encountered the organic light enough times when I could stabilize my perception, which means that once I saw it, I could keep it in my attention. This is not easy to do, by the way. I'm, I assure you, and I, I can tell you that there are uh, not a lot, but there are some people around the world who have done this with me, and they will tell you that they cannot do it in the way that I can, not yet, but they know that it's possible to do it in this way, to hold it. And then when I went to the Serenia de Ronda, 2003, I had the ideal environment out in the mountains with the vultures and the beautiful sky and everything and the night sky and the clouds to really, really get into it. And it was from doing it over and over again that I, that I formulated the protocols. And I said, okay, if I ever have the occasion to explain this to others or to guide them, I need to give them these protocols and these steps. So the protocols are really simple. 
There are quite a few, but I'll just name the main five protocols. Did I send you a memo on the protocols, by the way? No, I think you just sent me a link to an interview where you talk about it briefly. Okay, just, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll send you the memo. Yeah, and also with the protocols, are we talking about mushrooms or LSD or is it? Uh... Yeah, we're talking about mushrooms. Yeah. yeah, LSD, you can see the organic light on LSD. That's been proven by myself and mm. someone else, but you can't interact with it. So the protocols are very simple. Yeah. First of all, you uh, you don't hallucinate. You know when you go into this and you drink a mushroom potion and you start to hallucinate, you have to stop. You cannot hallucinate. You do not close your eyes. You keep your eyes open all the time. You do not sit down or lie down. You stand up. How do you stop the hallucinations if they come on? Well, <clears throat> it's a good question. See, the tendency, tendency to hallucinate will be, uh, will influence you to the degree that you are still in your ego. Because it's the monkey, the monkey mind of the ego mm. thinks that hallucinations are very amusing mm. and wants to be entertained. The monkey mind of the ego is like someone who is in the virtual and plays computer games and mm. prefers that to reality. So there's a ratio between your ability to just say, no, I'm not going to allow these hallucinations to overwhelm me and your ability to surrender your ego. And you don't get there unless you can surrender your ego. Hmm. But when, as you do, it makes this, uh, it makes it easier not to hallucinate. <clears throat> There's another saying we use, you know, stay behind the medicine, stay behind the medicine. That means that you take the medicine, you take, you drink the tea or you eat fresh psilocybe mushrooms, and this is a powerful medicine and it starts to influence your psyche. And if that medicine is behind you, it pushes you. So it'll push you to hallucinate. It'll push you to laugh. It'll push you to have silly, ridiculous ideas which you think are fantastically brilliant. No, you stay, you keep the medicine in front of you and you stay behind the medicine, you stay sober. Uh, one of the things that people typically do when the trance is coming on, all this is done out in the wilderness, by the way. You do not do this in a city. You do not do it in an office, in a hospital. You do it in wild nature. Uh, stamp stamp your feet. When the trance starts coming on, you start, stamp your feet. Get grounded. Stay grounded. Stand up. Keep your eyes open. And then there are certain phenomena that start to appear which is <clears throat> the first thing is you begin to see, even though you're not hallucinating, you see these veils. It's like you're, you're out, say, in a field, and there's a, a little, some grove of trees over here, and then there's a field, and maybe there's a little pond down there, and there's some mountains. So you're in the natural panorama, and you're just watching it. Watch nature. Look at what is there. Do not look for something that is not there. Okay. So you're looking intensely, but not staring. You have to keep your eyes kind of soft, but you look intensely into nature, like with the look of a child, of in the eyes of a one-year-old child. You see that look? Mm -hmm. That's the look you have to have. And <clears throat> as you as the trance comes on, people will typically see that there is a kind of transparent veils across your field of vision mm. and they're lace-like and they sort of move and dance back and forth like this this is a very important moment you're not hallucinating those veils are actually uh, membranes of the organic light and i used to call them her undies her knickers her underwear Mm -hmm. they are like the under the lace underwear of the goddess which shows you when you can see that you are getting close to her naked body 
because the organic light is her naked presence, okay? So at that point, something really important comes up, and this is related to another protocol, which is <clears throat> when the power of the mushroom starts to take over your body and you notice the effect, you speak to the plant ally. And you can do this out loud, and people often do. So there you are. You're starting to feel it. Come on, you know that you're feeling things that you wouldn't feel if you hadn't drunk that tea, right? Mm -hmm. And you know that you have given your nervous system to another species. Mm -hmm. You know, know what you know what you're doing. Okay. Then you say to them, uh, I am a fearless warrior. I am a lover of beauty. I do not need to be tested. I cannot be tested. Take me straight to beauty. And this is a formula that we use because typically what happens when people do these practices <clears throat> without discipline mm -hmm. is that that's when they start to have demons and my fears and they get paranoid or they start to think well i'm not a good person or they have bad feelings and of course everything is enormously exaggerated because you're in an altered state <clears throat> and it's often been said and i really really reject this view it's often been said well that's the torment and the ordeal that you have to go through like a rite of passage mm -hmm. in order to get to the sublime realization, right? So you should accept that you're going to have demons and angels and you're going to see serpentine forms in the lace. Often they take the form of dancing serpents and that scares people, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that is her intention. It's not her intention to scare you by showing you that. She shows you that. Her intention is to show you that if you have fear in yourself, you cannot approach her. She doesn't make you afraid. And in the presence of the organic light, believe me, there ain't nothing to be afraid of, not even death. But she knows that you can't come to her in humility and total presence if you have any kinds of fears that are tormenting you. Mm -hmm. And so these fears typically come up, and that's why we use the protocol. I am a fearless warrior. I cannot be tested. I do not need to be tested. Take me straight to beauty. And it works. Mm -hmm. it works. So, so that's a very interesting thing you say there. I, prior to our interview, I just, for the fun of it, I read through there is tons of so-called trip reports on the internet. People have sort of describing their experience of high doses of psilocybin mushrooms. And most of it is really, it's just fear, fear, anxiety. It's not so much rapture. And of course, no, I mean, they're not experienced shamans to make a lot of mistakes. Maybe they're doing it indoors. But still, it begs the question, how do you sort of bypass this fear? Because I, I suppose also that if you if you are in a state of, of um, heightened awareness and in a different frequency and if your main emotion is fear you might not channel Sophia but you can channel the archons and get all kinds of or, or how, how do you do it <laughs> yeah. yeah. of your own sick imagination and you know projections of your own stupid ego okay. this is what but you can avoid all that I never experienced that never and the people who do it in the way that I propose. Don't they don't experience it either? You know, it's often said. You've heard it, heard it said that there are two primary emotions: love and fear. Mm. <clears throat> I don't accept that formula, by the way. But in this instance, I will say that the way that you get through that is that your love triumphs over any fear that you might have. You you go to this experience. You cannot go to the organic light. First of all, if you do not know the story of the Ansophia, you have to know who you're going to meet. You have to know the conditions under which she is present in this soft, white luminosity. You have to know these things beforehand. And you also have to know 
that uh, your love for her, which is a love for the earth, transcends everything. And that love, if you genuinely feel it, it will carry you through any any fear, any any imagined phantoms and demons. It will carry you right through it. Hmm. Beauty. It's all about going to the ultimate beauty. Is it possible to put into words some encounter you had? Well, what I'm describing, <clears throat> there are two aspects. First of all, I am describing and have described at length what are the phenomenal effects yeah. of that experience, right? Uh, for instance, I've said that uh, the temperature drops. So even if it's a warm summer evening, the temperature as you approach the organic light will drop and you will be able to see your breath on a warm summer evening when you get close to the light. Mm. Another feature is that you will feel there are filaments on your face like cobwebs. Mm. And sometimes like people, you know, brush them away. And I say, no, no, it's, it's okay. The light has filaments, it has mycelia, and it's coming to you and touching you with its filaments. It's a living entity. It's a super organism composed hmm. of luminous living plasma. That's what it is. It's a plasma body of the earth. The earth is a radiant body and it emanates the organic light, but you can only see it in an altered state. The other characteristic is when you feel it, when you're so close to it <clears throat> that you feel it on your skin, you can feel it on your skin and it feels like melon. It says if someone took a slice of cantaloupe and they pressed it to your face. Now these, the Teleste of the mysteries would never have told anybody this publicly. Mm. What I'm doing now. I hope that whoever is listening realizes what I'm doing, yeah. okay? But I can assure you that these effects, and I could name six or eight more, are uh, common to everyone. They are the proof that you actually have this experience. Everyone has the same experience. And then when ultimately you get to see the light, you realize you're standing in the presence of it. What you see is that all matter is floating in it. And so there is a sense that everything floats. You lose the sense that you have any weight or anything has any weight. You can look at a mountain and it looks like it's floating. And guess what? It is. It is literally floating in the organic light because the organic light has the property of infinite buoyancy. And what is it? in this experience that makes it sort of the pinnacle of human experience that you read your fear of death or would you how would you describe it well many ways one is that you feel so super alive that the thought of death is just like a joke i mean death what are you talking about if i can feel this alive in the presence of the source of my life you're in the presence of the source of your life but death is like it's a joke. Uh, also, you have access to wisdom. You can ask her things. She will answer questions. She will show you things. You have access to the greatest teacher of all. Mm -hmm. The wisdom goddess is the greatest teacher of all. Mm -hmm. But it's just <laughs> indescribably beautiful. It's, it's the most beautiful thing in the world is to see this but when you see it you don't jump up and shout and jump up and down you will break the trance if you do that you have to come to her with a certain calm and steady poise mm. in order to maintain that experience <clears throat> so yeah it's i don't know what you know what else can i tell you about it you know i wish there some other people who've succeeded in experiencing the light among my students and friends were here and they could 
give you a word because just coming from me, you might think, well, what the fuck, you know, he's the only guy that knows this and he's the only one who's talking about this, but I'm not, mm. I'm not. So we're, we're going to wrap this up there. I want to bring up one more thing uh, just to introduce it with a topic, with a quote from your book, Not in His Image, which by the way, I, I recommend everybody to read. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, co-evolution with Sophia depends on contact with the goddess in her epiphany of the substantial milky light as the ancient initiates experienced it. But such contact is impossible as long as single self identity dominates consciousness. And this thing, single self identity, many people have, have talked about, like for instance, Albert Hoffman who discovered LSD, that this is really plaguing our culture and our, our civilization. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, it is a big issue, and I'm, I appreciate you bringing it up. It's it's relevant because it's one of the. It's not only an issue that comes up in the discussion of yeah. the organic, but it can also come up in the as an obstacle. Yeah. Say, single self identity is in a way just a fancy way of talking about your ego, mm -hmm. you know. But in a deeper sense, what it means is that. Uh, <clears throat> there's a paradox in, uh, in identity. You are an individual. There's no doubt about it. You know, there is you, and there's never going to be anyone like you again, mm -hmm. and there never was before. You are a singularity. Every one of us is a singularity. And so that is the truth about the single self. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it is that you can't know that truth if you just hold it by yourself. See, that's the pit of narcissism mm -hmm. and self-obsession. When you hold that awareness of your human singularity in the presence of the source that gave you life, mm -hmm. then it's transcendent, you see? Mm -hmm. So in and of itself, it's a dead end. But I must emphasize that at, uh, in conclusion, and maybe this is an important qualification, uh, Repeated experiences and encounters with the Aeon Sophia do not dissolve your identity. They, in fact, make you stronger as an individual. Mm. But you're just an individual who knows that your life is not yours in the first place. Yeah. Her life. You are just a, an expression of her life. And this is the most beautiful transcendent truth that that I could share with you. Hmm. There is this, uh, uh, as we talked about, Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, I think also maybe 1945 or something. A lot of things happened in that year. Uh, yeah. he, wrote, he wrote the book uh, towards sort of the end of his life called LSD, My Problem Child. Right. Where he talks about it as a wonder child that really had sort of the potential to heal this human separation from nature. I just want to read you a short quote and get your take on it. He talks about, quote, a catastrophic destruction of the environment that could not have emerged from a consciousness of reality in which human beings are not separated from the environment, but rather exist as part of living nature in the universe. Healing would mean existential experience of a deeper self-encompassing reality. All attempts today to make amends for the damage through environmentally protective measures must remain only hopeless, superficial patchwork. Yeah, well, that's beautifully said. And he definitely knew what he was talking about. Yeah. So, you know, he said that at the end of that book, you know, that uh, LSD was a problem child because the introduction of LSD into the world posed some problems and raises some very valid questions. Yeah. But he said at the end, it's really my wunderkind. Yeah. It's my wonder child. You know? Well, what is the wonder child? You are the wonder child. Mm. I am the wonder child. Every individual who can stand in the presence of their divine mother and, and handle that obliterating beauty 
is a wonder child to her. So she welcomes her children into her life. And this is another effect that I can describe to you, that when you're in the presence of the organic light, it's an animal. It acts like an animal. It has emotional and animal reactions. And when the Aeon Sophia knows that the human animal standing in front of her knows who she is, you go knowing who she is, otherwise you're not going to get there then she flushes amber. Hmm. So this is a real effect. Generally, the luminal, the optical quality of the organic light is soft, white, and it has the texture of marshmallow. Hmm. But there are moments when it blushes. Hmm. When she has emotions, the light blushes. And one of those blushes is the blush of amber, hmm. which is the way she shows, it's like through that, she says to you, yes, I behold you. You are my child beholding your source. It's all really very simple. It's like a magnificent fairy tale that's completely real. Yeah. I remember when I saw this movie, Easy Rider, I think it came out 1969. And right. I saw it again like 30 years later, and I, I understood it more than... And the, to the, these two motorbikers go out to, to find the true America, and there's a lot of trips and parties. But at the end of at the end of the trip, they get sort of killed by some rednecks. But before that, one of them, I think Henry Fonda, plays this role. He says to the other one, "We blew it." And I realized the second time I saw it that it probably meant the '60s. And there's yeah. this, yeah, psychedelic scholar Robert Forte. He has said that a sort of direct experience of the divine is the gold of spiritual seekers everywhere but without the proper framework to understand mystical experience even glorious encounters with the divine can be problematic or confusing and it has to be sort of a framework to exist to structure and define these experiences i don't know if you agree with that and if maybe you could just say a few words about your own mystery school well, I do agree with that. I met Robert Forte, by the way. I oh. met him at the International Psychedelic Forum in Boston. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I agree. But well, what does he propose for a framework and a discipline? I don't know if he has one, but I sure do. Hmm. So the framework is the story of, of the wisdom goddess. You have to know the story. Getting back to our initial point, uh, being directed. You know, the story, the narrative tells you what you're going to see, who you're going to meet. <clears throat> and then you follow these specific protocols, uh, which are simple, mm -hmm. uh, in order to stay on track. Because uh, when you go into high trance, uh, you're, not, you're not in control of your body necessarily in the way that you are normally. Mm -hmm. you know? So <clears throat> it's a discipline. And it's a discipline that I teach. And I don't know how many people even know that I teach it. But uh, it's the same as the discipline of the ancient mysteries. So I recovered it. And I restored it. And it's my great you know, pleasure to tell you that that's what I did. Where can people find your school? Uh, Nemeta on the internet. So platform, N-E-M-E-T-A dot org yeah yeah dot org emeta dot yeah. org so just That's my, uh, social media presence i don't do telegram or uh, uh, i i don't do anything else i don't do facebook you know so just a final one final question you, you have talked about many times that we have been torn out from our sort of primordial connection with, with gaia with the living intelligence of the planet what does it mean for a society to have the mysteries as compared to not having them? Well, to me, it means uh, it's, it's not difficult to explain. It's either, uh, it's like I would uh, quote a saying in Planetary Tantra, we attribute the saying to the mother Kali, Kali being an aspect of Sophia. Mm -hmm. particularly of her of Sophia's rage mm -hmm. so Kali is Kali is a very powerful witch mm -hmm. and she's protector and and Kali says 
either you are party to my supernatural magic or you are rubble. And that's what I say. The life without the mysteries, a society, a community without the mysteries in the future is rubble. It's the cremation ground of Kali. That's the only option. It's either go to the core of the mystery of life or end up in the rubble. To me, there's no middle road. And that's where we are today. I believe so. Well, I want to thank you, John, very much once again for a very fascinating conversation. Well, my pleasure. We seem to converse pretty well. Yeah, we get along. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> sure do. So I'm going to stop this recording here.